Hi, I'm Lorraine Peters on Rogers TV. You know, my show, Friends with Manners, is all about maneuvering through the modern world and getting along with people and getting through different experiences. So I would love to have guests on my show that reach out to me from the community. So if you have a friend or a family member who you think has a great idea, shoot us a message. Find us on rogerstv.com. Tonight's episode, you know, it's a very special show tonight. And coincidentally, both of my guests are long-term friends of mine. And both of these women journeyed with their young husbands through what is known as medical assistance in dying. I know I hadn't heard of it either. And it may be relatively new to a lot of you, which is even more reason to, to watch. The, both of these women I consider to be heroic. They, they not only stood by their husbands, but uh, in the case of, of Kim, she's also a registered nurse. You will meet her soon when the episode starts. And she stopped working to take care of her husband and saw this through together right until the moment that his life ended. So it is an amazing story, but you're also going to be educated and inspired and informed to think about the last days of your life or somebody else's life in a completely different way, I promise you. So I hope that you enjoy this episode. Again, I'm Lorraine Peters, your host of Friends with Manners. And this episode is about medical assistance in dying. They also call it MAID. I hope you enjoy it. Have you ever thought about your own death? I think we've all joked about it. Uh, do we ever have some romantic notions of dying peacefully in our very old age, having ticked off everything on our to-do list? I think we can relate to that. But we all know that life doesn't always turn out that way. And sometimes life can be cruel. And people who are young and should have a, a long time left on this earth end up with, you know, terminal diagnosis and they know that their life is going to come to an end uh, in, a, in a very short period of time. So should we get to manage our death much like we managed our life? Well, my two guests tonight, my extraordinary guests are going to be able to answer those questions and a few more because both of these women journeyed with their husbands through what is called MAID, uh, and they're going to tell us more about medical assistance in dying. So we are in for an extraordinary interview. So I want to first introduce Kim Elliott. Kim is a registered nurse, and as I mentioned, did journey with her husband, Rob, through this uh, entire uh, procedure from, from diagnosis to death. So Kim, welcome, and thank you very much for joining me tonight. Thank you, Lorraine. It's my pleasure. Okay, so Kim, you are a registered nurse. I would like to start with, can you ground our audience in your rendition of, you know, the medical terminology and definition of, of MAID? Well, quite honestly, the, if, you, if you research the definition, it, it's simply the acronym, it's simply medical assistance in dying. When, a, when an individual seeks medical assistance to, to aid in ending their life, um, that really is the definition. And I have to say recently, this is just a timely interview because it was just within a couple of weeks ago, I was having a conversation with a colleague who referred to it as physician assisted suicide. And I took immediate offense to the term and then realized that there really hasn't been a lot of ed education out there. It's, it's still something that's kind of lurking and people, people don't really understand. And um, uh, physician assistant, assisted suicide clearly uh, is open to interpretation, but also um, has a negative con connotation and it's, it's very controversial. Uh, so I was very happy to see that the terminology has changed in, ter in terms of official you know, policies and whatnot. Um, but I still think there's a lot of education that needs to take place there um, because as we know, it isn't, it shouldn't be uh, synonymous with suicide. So as far as the definition goes, I'd have to say the, the acronym is perfect. And it's just when somebody feels that they, 
there, well, I shouldn't say that they feel there's a, there's no options because there's lots of criteria involved. It's very hard to talk about the definition without talking about the criteria, the eligibility criteria. You know, do you, as a nurse and also as Rob's wife, view this as, you know, a medical uh, intervention or a medical um, uh, procedure, much like things we embrace every day? Absolutely. It, it, it definitely is. And I, there's so many pieces to it. There's so many medical pieces to it, but at the very um, essence of it, it's, it's relief, it's peace. It's, it's, uh, again, I, I feel like it's providing somebody with peace, providing with somebody with a humane service. Um, yeah. But it's, at the same time, it is, it's, it's a medical procedure. There, it's very, um, it's governed. It's, there's, again, a lot of criteria that needs to be met. That's the part that people don't understand. Yes, I was actually on, uh, in doing my research for, for this show, I was on this site, um, a Canadian site, Dying with Dignity in Canada. And I watched about a 90 minute video on the, um, you know, the action plan, uh, the, the advanced care planning that goes into this with a patient uh, and their loved one is very extensive. There is no stones left unturned and their, their beliefs and uh, their wishes are, you know, in these very extensive uh, advanced care plans. So tell me, uh, tell us about Rob, tell us why this was uh, made sense for him, Kim. Well, again, like I said, it was kind of presented to us as a, an afterthought. And I say that because we, we, were, we, we were doing quite well at home. I was caring for him with the help from extramural nursing. And we just got to a point where we couldn't keep up with the, the experiments and the different uh, prescriptions and trying this and trying that. By the time you access your extramural nurse to access it or connect with the doctor and, and make those changes, he wasn't feeling relief quick enough. So we decided it was time to, to be admitted to palliative care. So when we went to palliative care and we um, met with some of the doctors, um, they, they immediately talked about what our goals were. And at this point, you know, we, we had known for probably eight months that Rob wasn't going to beat this illness. So we had plenty of time to prepare emotionally, financially, all those things. And we were sort of blessed with that time. And that's the way I look at it. Um, so when we got there, obviously relief was what we were looking for. He just needed some of these symptoms to be taken care of more promptly. Uh, he was getting frustrated and, and dehydrated. And, you know, at this point, really nothing was working and we needed things to happen more streamlined. So we were admitted to palliative care. And um, I think we were probably there a week uh, trying a few things, trying some new meds. I think he was on eight anti-nausea meds because that was his main symptom. Um, and then I noticed this significant anxiety with Rob and Rob was the most even keeled individual. He was never, he just never got too excited, never got to, never really showed a lot of emotion, just very logical, analytical thinker. Um, so to see him restless and, and anxious, it, it was really starting to get to me. And I'd had had several conversations with his doctor and I finally just said, I think I need to ask him if he's afraid. So when I finally just flat out said, like, are, are you afraid? And what are you afraid of? He said, you know, I'm not afraid to die. He knew that that was coming. Um, I accept that. He said, however, I don't know how I'm going to die. I don't know what it's going to look like. So for Rob, he always had a fear, as many of us do, of drowning. So he thought, like, am I going to be short of breath? Am I going to be gasping for air? And is it, is it going to be, you know, really intense? And is it going to be painful? Like, and, and Rob, like I said, was very logical, very um, uh, well read and did a lot of research on his own, but this was just something he couldn't quantify. He couldn't imagine how this was going to feel. So we, we talked to the doctor and it, that was when Dr. O'Brien presented what it might look like for, you know, there's palliative sedation was the first thing that he presented as an option. And that would be obviously, um, you know, sort of like a coma almost, you know, they, they medicate you, keep you comfortable. And, and, you know, in palliative sedation situations the the patient can hear and understand when people are in the room and different things like that. 
and Rob is just kind of like, oh yeah, you know, and you know, yeah, but he, it didn't, it didn't feel to him like it was the right plan, but really didn't have a lot of choice. And then all of a sudden, Dr. Um, O'Brien mentioned medical assistance in dying. And I kind of reacted because I learned a little bit about it in school. I, like I said, I was a recent grad, did not know it was accessible in New Brunswick. And so of course, um, you know, Dr. O'Brien gave us the, the um, explanation and the information. And, and very, very shortly after that, Rob said, I really think I need to explore this. So within a day or two, the anxiety was completely resolved. And it was mostly, I believe, attributed to the fact that he now felt he had some control and he, and he felt like he had an option that was acceptable to him. So um, having said that, it was the next day when Dr. O'Brien came back in and explained, he said, the one thing I didn't mention to you was there's a 10 day waiting period. So, and I don't know how much we're going to get into that, but there's a 10 day waiting period from when you initially um, express interest or uh, it, in this procedure and when the, the time is coming or the, the date and time of the procedure to take place. So there's 10, 10 days. Rob was, uh, again, I think I mentioned already, very well read, very smart uh, man and knew that, you know, three months of not eating properly and not being able to hydrate himself properly, that electrolyte imbalances can affect your cognitive function. Yeah. And he felt like he didn't have 10 days. So when Dr. Grant came, or Dr. O'Brien came back in to, to have this discussion about the 10 days, Rob said this, he said, well, Dr. O'Brien, yesterday you gave me all the power and today you've taken it all away. So Dr. Brian, I, I could see his expression, you know, kind of like, wow, <laughs> you know what? I, yeah, I, I kind of did. So at that point, he ex explained the fact that, you know, if it's, if it's, um, I don't really know how to turn to, to say this properly, but if two physicians don't believe that that patient has that kind of time, then it becomes a gray area. And as long as those two physicians agree um, that, you know, he may not have 10 days, then they, they would sign off and, and, and be okay with that. So again, then, then Rob took that back, took the control back. And literally after that, I felt like we were truly able to live out those last few days with just, just the absence of burden, abs absence of, of unknown and, and, you know, the, the pain that he anticipated or the, the intensity of his, of his passing. Okay, Kim, that, I'm going to come back to you. That is, I, I wanted to let you finish that out because that was, uh, that was a pretty uh, amazing picture that you painted of, of how that gave Rob that, and you as well, the, the, the peace and, and the feeling of control. Uh, Leanne, let's switch over to you for a few moments. So Leanne, I want you to share what kind of man Will was in his life and why did made medical assistance in dying make sense for him? That's a great question. And much like Kim shared with, with Rob, Will was very much in control. He was very analytical, very logical, and um, that's how he lived his life. And um, so it made sense to him. He, he very um very just matter of fact we would tell people you know that maybe didn't understand his decisioning of this that um, you know you maybe have had a pet in your life a little four-legged family member you see they're coming to the end of their life you see they're suffering and you make a decision to call the vet and have them euthanized which euthanasia by the way means good death and so that's what he said to himself that he believed it was um it was compassionate and he believed it was um, just, it was something he wanted to do to, to remain dignified in his death. And like Kim had shared, Will was not afraid of dying. He was, however, afraid of some of the symptoms he may experience along the journey. So one of his main symptoms based on his cancer and the medication he was on, he was at a very great risk of having a stroke. And he did not want to live his life having a stroke, being incapacitated, not being able to communicate his basic needs, feeling he was a burden to the family and, and even the medical system itself. 
So for him, he made the decision very early on. When he was diagnosed, he was actually stage four metastasized. So he was, uh, from, from diagnosis to death, was seven months, seven days. And he, in October, made the decision. So like Kim was sharing about that 10-day waiting period. Um, we well surpassed that in, in the, uh, the waiting period of that. And um, then for him, it was just a matter of fact that it's time to do it. So he called the shots. And for someone like Will that was so in control of his own self, that was important to him. He, I feel, wrote it out a very long time, probably longer than I would have. And um, so he spent 11 days in palliative care and then made the decision to, um, to have the procedure on March 18th, just of last year. But I think it's also important to know that although he died that day, he was with his death sentence seven months and seven days prior with his diagnosis. He was terminal. It was inoperable, incurable, rare, and aggressive. So he knew what that journey would look like for him. So having that sense of control and um, just the sense of knowing, and there was a real piece for me as well, knowing this is what he chose, knowing that, um, you know, it gave us the time, once that decision was made, it gave us the time to talk about other things, you know, the things he wanted from my life and from my future. So I feel it was an absolute gift to, to him, um, to me and to us as a couple. So Leanne, that brings up a, uh, something that Kim alluded to as well, you know, the anxiety around not knowing how the last moments are going to be. And, you know, let's be honest, the, the, the types of, of um, cancers that both Rob and Will had were very aggressive and, and terminal. There was no coming out of it. And if allowed to play out to the bitter end on their own would be horribly, you know, painful, um, you know, and, and many other things that, that really to animals we would see as cruel. So I think it's, um, I, I think it is an act of compassion to allow people to play out and manage their death just like they would their life. Absolutely, absolutely, Rain. So for people who, you know, back to Kim's opening statement about hearing one of her coworkers refer to this as a physician assisted suicide, what, what would you say to people who maybe have it still framed up in their mind like that? I think back to the very old Dr. Kevorkian days of where this was very much uh, an underworld kind of uh, bad thing people were engaging in. How do we, A, how do we change that narrative? And B, what would you say from your experience to people who are, are opposed to this? Sure. So changing the narrative, I think, is happening. It's like Kim mentioned, just changing the name of it from doctor assisted suicide to medical assistance in dying. It is simply a procedure. It is a procedure that um, that assisted him with his death. It stopped his, you know, it stopped his breathing. It stopped his heart. For those that that want to maybe call it suicide or compare it to suicide, I would challenge them in that people who commit suicide want to die. They don't see any other way out. Many times they are not physically sick. They, they are not terminally ill, I will say. Um, sometimes, of course, they may be. But those, those that commit suicide want to die. They want to end their life. Those that choose MAID are actively dying. So it's not something that, that he went into saying, I want to end my life. Um, it, it was, I am terminally ill. And I want to have control over how I die, when I die. And um, so it, it really is two very different, um, two very different procedures. And Leanne, you know, where do you kind of see this going? You know, again, when I was doing some of my research on dying with dignity in Canada, they, some of the nurses and doctors talked about how this is evolving. And much like people are very different in their life, uh, some are private, some are more exuberant and very social, that's starting to be reflected in how they're managing their death. 
Some people are having, you know, last goodbye parties. Some people are having what they call living funerals. And then right down to people who are very private and just want to, you know, have control over, uh, you know, the, the day and the hour of their death. So how, how do you see this uh, playing out over the years? I certainly see it becoming a more uh, common option. I think that we have a long way to go in terms of educating people and informing people. Um, I know there are, are some discussions right now within the Supreme Court to change the qualifications of, of those that are able to use MAID in itself. Um, right now, you it does require you to be terminally ill. Um, so I, I do see that changing. I think that would be a, a wonderful option for people who uh, maybe have other illnesses that, um, you know, or, or other conditions. Um, and I see it just becoming a household thing. You know, I, I remember being 12 years old, the first time I saw a commercial on television for organ donation. And it wasn't really something we talked about. And I had never heard of it, but I went to my family and said, hey, I would want to do that. And now organ donation is something that I think everyone knows of. It's a very common topic. There's no real taboo around it. So I see MAID going in that direction. I, I see people talking about it. I see people making informed decisions and, um, and it won't be for everyone. I think it's a wonderful option for those that choose to have the control over their own life and death. Um, but I do see it becoming a more, you know, this has only been since 2016. So when the Supreme Court of Canada ruled unanimously in the favor of MAID. So again, a very new procedure, very new to New Brunswick. And um, you know, even as recently as today, when, when I, was, uh, I was at a doctor's appointment and speaking to the nurse about it, and she was very, she didn't know a lot about MAID. So I thought that was really interesting that someone in the medical profession did not have any experience of it, but also didn't really have an understanding of what it was. And um, I think we need to have conversations around it and be informed about it. And people can make those decisions as part of their end of life plan. Yeah, I, I agree with you very much that the more we talk about it and the more we normalize it, much like a conversation about organ donation, it's not gonna be for everybody, but the idea that just, you know, um, it's okay if it's for you, it's not for me, but hey, you know, you do you. I, I like to think that, that we can get to a place uh, like that, um, you know, with, with medical assistance in dying. Kim, I'm gonna switch over uh, back to you for our last uh, few remaining minutes. And I wanna ask you uh, one of the questions I asked Leanne, where do you see this, you know, with Bill C-7 and already um, amendments being made to that bill, uh, where do you see this going in the future? What do you think are the possibilities? Well, I certainly, I certainly think it's all going in the right direction. I, I echo everybody else's comments about um, there needing to be more dialogue. Um, people need to be able to think beyond somebody just wanting to end their life. They have to think more about, you know, quality of life and bringing, bringing meaning to their life, especially as they're ending, they're getting towards the end of their life. Um, there was a statement in the eligibility criteria that um, I wanted to focus on because um, for us, for Rob and I, that became quality of life and just the, the, the finer moments of a day became so much more important. And, and the statement in the um, policy at Horizon Health stated, uh, for eligibility criteria, a patient who is enduring physical or psychological suffering that is intolerable to them and cannot be relieved under conditions that they consider acceptable. So, you know, they're encouraging, they were, we were encouraging the, our team to, to understand that that was, that was the most important piece is that this was all about quality of life. And that would be how I would, you know, um, approach it with people who are tentative about it. I would say, you know, if you were given the opportunity to to um, improve the quality of those last few days, wouldn't you do it? Um, and then as far as where we're going in the future, working in long term care, um, you know, we had a resident not long ago uh, seek medical assistance in dying because for her and it boiled down to her quality of life. She had had a stroke. She was she felt like she was plateaued, you know, it, and 
there was really no, um, you know, means for her to improve her day to day. She didn't feel that, you know, not being able to feed herself was, was quality of life for her. Um, so, and so that was the, the conversation that sort of, um, revolved around that for her was this isn't this isn't what I want for myself um and so for her um I think for our facility that was the first time we had had anyone choose medical assistance in dying and in that instance you know she had all of her cognitive faculties and was able to make that decision I see um residents on a daily basis that if if they could go back in time um when they were well and be able to speak about what their wishes were from this perspective, from quality of life perspective, um, you know, if if they were able to choose that option, um, I think a lot of them would. So I agree. I agree. We're down to about a minute. Leanne, I want to ask you in that short time frame we have left, what does this do to alleviate? the suffering for family, for, for you as wives, what does this do in that regard? You know, for me, I can speak of the experience of losing my dad. My dad died actually two years before my husband and he did not choose the maid option. And we spent 23 days in palliative care with him waiting, just simply waiting, waiting for him to die. And it was excruciating. It was painful for him. And it was excruciating, it was emotionally excruciating for us as a family. So in comparison to Will, once he had made the decision, the time had been set, there was just a peace and an understanding of this is happening at, you know, at five o'clock on, on Wednesday evening. And um, so there was, you know, in comparison, there simply was, uh, there simply was no comparison. And, um, you know, there was there again, I just go back to that piece of an understanding and an acceptance. And um, there's there's something quite magical in the knowing when your loved one is going to die. Thanks to both of my fabulous guests tonight, Kim Elliott and Leanne Cochran. Uh, to my guests, uh, thank you very much. To my audience, I'll see you right back here next time on Rogers TV.